A reading from 1 Corinthians. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. (laughs) Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you will know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all of these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cock crow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us here today in this place, or virtually wherever we're watching, today. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Help us to hear your words, to know them in our heart, and to live them out this week. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So when I was beginning the service, the guys in the front kept waving at me, and I go, they're really excited. And then I realized my mic wasn't on. So um, anyway, thank you for... uh, getting me mic'd up. Have you ever felt stuck? Maybe literally or metaphorically, you just felt like you were a place in your life where you were stuck. Well, my wife had the privilege of marrying me and I keep things very exciting because I'm constantly getting myself in jams where I've lost my keys, where I can't find my wallet or my cell phone. I'm stuck and she helps me find them or comes and meets me somewhere to give me the spare set, whatever it might be. 
Well, I remember one time, even my wife's amazing abilities did not work. I had got back from Honduras and I was all excited about the trip and I found out there was a Honduras, a Honduran restaurant in Bluffton and I wanted to take my wife there. And she's like, you know, I've had that kind of food. I'm not really crazy about it. I'm from Brazil. It's just not my type of food. So I took him to the restaurant. You know, you're with somebody and they really want you to like the food. And she just really didn't, you know, the restaurant was great. She didn't like it. And our kids, it was five years ago. So Zelia was a baby. Ilo was five. So they're all running around and crying. We're at the restaurant. And it's time to go and I reach for my keys and I'm like, oh no, where are my keys? We're looking under the booth, maybe Isla threw them somewhere. Go back to the car and there they are locked in the Honda Civic. And I'm like, Veronica of course would have her spare set, but this time she did not. So like, what do we do? The house is locked, the keys are in there. So I tried calling my neighbor who was a locksmith, he didn't answer, I texted him, he didn't answer. I went through uh, Google search to find all the local locksmiths. It was a Friday night. Nobody was answering. Finally, I got some guy who was like a retired locksmith. I got him out of retirement or sleep or wherever he was from. I'm not even sure if he was a locksmith, but he came there and he could not get in the Honda Civic. And I'm thinking, what kind of locksmith is this, right? And uh, so then I said, well, maybe you can break into my house. You're a locksmith after all. <laughs> so we get a ride from a friend and he follows us to our house and uh, he cannot get in the house. Like, it's the point where I'm trying to help him with his gadgets, and I don't know what I'm doing, right? So we're stuck out of our house, we're stuck out of the car, and finally the locksmith goes away. Sorry, can't help us. Still trying to call my neighbor, not working. We finally call my one friend who can, like, do anything. So he comes with his set of tools, and an hour later, and a lot of gadgets, we're able to get into the car, and finally, our little night at the Honduran restaurant turned to be about five hours later, we are unstuck back in the house. It was a long evening. I think all of us have had times like that. Hopefully you don't lose stuff like me, but we've had times where we felt stuck, you know, very literally stuck. We you know, were in a, in a jam, we couldn't get out of it. But probably this year, many of us have felt stuck because of what's gone on in our culture with this pandemic, where we felt stuck in the house. Maybe we've had loved ones or relatives that we couldn't see, travel plans that got canceled. I know recent college graduates who had big plans of what they were gonna do and their particular field froze up because of the economy uh, going bad during all of this. We have college students who had to go back and forth to college because of lockdowns. It has not been an easy year. Perhaps more than anything, it's reminded us that sometimes we need a lot more help than we think we do. We're not as self-reliant as we thought. Now is the time for us as believers to re-examine our faith, the sustenance of our lives as believers and why it really matters. I know many people who have been discouraged a bit from, with their faith this year and they felt like, where is God in all of this? And it's been a frustration on so many different levels. But this morning I want us to take a fresh look at the gospel to be reminded about what is our Christian faith all about, to go back to the basics. We'll talk about Advent and the hope that we have with Christ coming and Christ coming again. And I think we're gonna find, when we look, take a fresh look at the gospel, it gives us all the tools that we need as we find ourselves at times going through difficult times like now. We're gonna find that we have a community of believers and the power of the Holy Spirit to live this faith out. And we're also gonna be reminded this morning that the story ends well. That in spite of how dark things may look right now or things that you've gone through before, for all of us who, who are believers, we have a sure inheritance. Well, like any story as we go into it this morning, it has a beginning. And for those of you who know the, the Bible, in Genesis, in the beginning, everything was good. God created creation and he, after each day he said, this is good. And then he created people and he said, this is very good. And we know the story of Adam and Eve in the garden, how they worked the garden and work was good, how they were with God and it was good. But then they decided, you know what? Maybe it's not good enough. Maybe we can do life on our own. So they ate from the forbidden fruit and then we experienced, or they experienced, 
And every generation since has experienced brokenness. Brokenness in relationships of people saying no to God and yes to self. And that's where the word sin comes from. We see it played out in the Old Testament. The prophets talked about it. The prophets talked about the predicament that everybody is in because of what happened with Adam and Eve. The prophet Isaiah says, all of us have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous acts are like filthy rags. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. You have your, hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Then the prophet goes on and says, do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are your people. And then the prophet Ezekiel gives us a little more hope. He says, and I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them, as he's speaking for the Lord. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. He will turn our heart of stones into a heart of flesh. This is what Ezekiel prophesied. But you see, God, that wasn't the end of the story right there. God sent his son, son Christ to deal with our brokenness. He takes up all the broken pieces of our lives, the sin of trying to do life on our own, puts them on the cross. Peter writes, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Through the cross, we have redemption. We have reconciliation. You may be wondering why I have these mosaics right here. If you all can't see them from the sides, you can kind of see them there uh, through the screen. So our high school youth group, we reminded them that on their own, they were broken. So they broke pottery with hammers. They really enjoyed doing that, some of them a little too much. <laughs> and then they started gluing this pottery, this board, not really knowing what they were making. They were just instructed with the heart to put the dark pieces here in the middle where the trace was, and they had four quadrants, so they couldn't figure out it was heart. And the same thing with the middle school who did the cross. So I reminded them that God can, uses their brokenness, their sin of trying to do life on their own. And through the cross, he gives us a new heart. He puts all the brokenness in our, in our lives back together again to take that heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. The Apostle Paul writes, this righteousness is available to everyone. It is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, that all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. There's not an in-group and an out-group. This is extended to everybody who puts their faith in Christ. Through the work of the cross, they can have a new heart heart of flesh. So the reason I bring this out, I know for a lot of you this may be elementary Christianity, but so often we forget about this. We forget about our brokenness, our sin. We try to do faith. We try to do life on our own. We oftentimes see this played out in the church where sin is ignored. And let me tell you, this is a false gospel. Sometimes we see it in churches who they do an amazing job in the community and they help feed the poor and they do all this, but they never address the brokenness, the poverty of spirit. So it's incomplete. And then we have churches that try to meet the felt needs of the congregation without talking about their sin and brokenness. They may have sermon series that say five ways to a better marriage, four ways to have less stress in your life, three ways to not lock your keys in your car. <laughs> Whatever it may be, but if they're not talking about brokenness, even though the Bible has lots of practical advice for our lives, even though the Bible says explicitly that we're supposed to feed the poor and take care of them, if we're not talking about brokenness, if not, that's not the foundation of our need for God, of our need for what Christ did on the cross, it's the wrong gospel. It's not good news at all. So that is our starting point. So for those of us who have put our faith, who believe, who recognize our brokenness, we're called to be courageous people of hope in the here and now, regardless of what life uh, brings our way. Peter, 
who guy who was very familiar with blowing it and trying to do life on his own, he denied Christ three times at his time of most need, wrote later, somebody who understood that he was loved and reconciled. And it wasn't on his own strength. He writes these words, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So therefore, we are people who have a living hope. Yes, we recognize our brokenness. Yes, we recognize we can't fix ourselves. But this is really good news because we recognize what Jesus did. We recognize that we have a Savior. We recognize that we've been given grace. And therefore, we have hope. Therefore, we are in Christ, as it says in 2 Corinthians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. One of my seminary professors at Regent said, you can't get any closer than in. In Christ. That's the living hope that we have. So our inness, I'm going to make that a word, okay, today. Our inness helps us to live out the faith in the world. We're not just supposed to keep it in here and kind of be this exclusive country club. We are adopted into God's family. We become the body of Christ in the local church. And we are powered by the Holy Spirit and by this body of believers to live this out in the world. In our reading from uh, this morning in 1 Corinthians, it said this, For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. God, it says right here, God Lose my place here a sec. Oh, yeah. So it says, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. We're fully equipped. We don't need to go to 10 more seminars or read 20 more books. That may be good, but we have everything we need right here through the power of the Holy Spirit and the community of believers and God's word to live this out. We don't need to wait. Wait till we become graduate Christians or get our doctorate in Christianity. We're called as the laity, as the clergy, to live this out. Paul uses the metaphor of the church as a body. And it sounds really good, but oftentimes we don't think of it. We're like, oh yeah, we're the body of Christ. But bodies weren't meant to sit around. Bodies were meant to move. And bodies weren't meant to act on their own. They're meant to act collectively, to complement each other with our different gifts. So this gospel is good news. It's meant to be shared. In the Lord's Prayer, we say, the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. This isn't just a little like, uh, you know, kind of good luck kind of prayer that we pray before football games like I used to do when I played high school football. No, this is a prayer of life. It's a call of duty for the church. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit, by this body of believers to live out this faith in the world. A body is meant to move. So we have brokenness. We have redemption and reconciliation from what Christ did on the cross, giving us a new heart to go out into the world with our inness in Christ, to go out and to share the hope we have in Christ. Yes, we feed the poor. Yes, we tell them about how the Bible does have something to say about your relationships. It has very good practical advice. But all of that is built on the foundation of our brokenness, of our reconciliation and redemption that comes through Christ. And finally, we have a secure future in Christ. You know, it's that time of year, at least for me, I don't know how your life insurance works, where every year I got to pay my life insurance, right? The bill comes in the mail. I'm like, oh, Merry Christmas, right? The life insurance is great for my family, but for me, I don't really get to benefit it from it so much, right? You know, if I pass away, they, you know, the house is paid off and they have a little bit of change in their pocket, but the life insurance that Christ offers for those of us who put our faith, is very different. You see, then we understand that we have eternal life in Christ. That word throughout John's gospel is a life that begins in the here and now. That we experience the eternal life, the lasting life of faith, as we're empowered here and we live it out in the world. We're reminded that not only do we belong, but yes, we have a home. We're reminded in today's reading that we have a future, that Christ is coming back. 
that all of us, as Greg Kranz likes to say, in the next 100 years will meet Christ because none of us are going to live to be 120. Maybe if you have enough vitamins, I don't know. But we're all going to meet Christ. And we're also reminded of the hope of him coming back. In many traditions, the first candle is known as the hope candle. We're reminded in this time of Advent that we do have hope. In our gospel reading, it says, be on guard, be alert, to keep watch, to be prepared that Christ is coming back. But in this preparation, we're not supposed to like hunker down and build bunkers. You see, this being on watch prevents us from having sloppy living. Just saying, ah, Christ is coming back, I'm just gonna do whatever I want. No, that's good news. That should fill us with joy. That should be something that makes us want to go out and share this good news with everybody. And we don't try to predict when he's coming back. There's been enough bad books written by that. We don't know. It says it right there in the scripture. But we live as if he's coming back tomorrow, even if it's thousands of years from now. But we have that hope that eternal life is real. That it's not the end of the story. When Jesus rose again, he told his disciples that he was coming back. We prepare, prepare for Christ's coming by living out the gospel in the here and now. This lives, these lives of preparation does not withdraw us from the world, but puts us right into the world. And we don't lack anything, as I reminded you before. In our reading in 1 Corinthians, it says, Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. These gifts were always meant for other people, to be lived out into the world, the gifts of the Holy Spirit that he brings us. We know the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, all of those. He also gifts us in other unique ways of speaking, of encouraging different ways that he encourages us to live that out into the world. Finally, on Judgment Day, when you all do meet Christ, it's not going to be like Santa Claus where he has this list of all the good things versus the bad things, whether you've been naughty or nice. There's one question for each and every one of us is, were you in Christ or were you in self? Were you trying to do life on your own or you recognize what Christ did for you on the cross? Do you recognize that you can get a new heart when you, when you are in Christ? When you say no to self and yes to what Christ did? He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son Jesus Christ our Lord. So I want to conclude with a couple reminders to you individually and us as a church. First of all, God works through your brokenness. God works to redeem that and to reconcile it. He did that on the cross. He gives us a new heart. And even as we're believers and we go through those things that break our heart in life, he is constantly remolding us and renewing us. That is why it is so important for you as a believer to be part of the local church. This is where you get fueled back up. This is where you get encouraged. This is where you get prayed for. A matter of fact, at the end of this service, if you guys are experiencing brokenness or if you need prayer about anything, we have a prayer team that will pray for you right here at the altar. So I encourage you to do that. God works through your brokenness. It's really good news for all of us because it recognizes to us that we need God and God is close to the brokenhearted. Secondly, he has invited us to be a part of a family. He has invited you to be a part of this family. And what that takes is just saying no to self, yes to God. I believe. Help me with my unbelief. And finally, we are reminded that when we're in Christ, we have a secure future. And I believe this helps us to live courageously. When we don't fear death, we're more courageous in the way we live life every day. We know that nothing can separate us from God when we're in Christ. Therefore, we're more willing to cross the street, to talk to that neighbor, to bring this hope into the world. 
So I encourage you all, get prayed for, pray for others, bring this hope to other people. In just a little bit, we as the church are going to have Eucharist. You know, the great thing about our Anglican tradition, with a lot of liturgical uh, traditions, we were reminded about this every week. We're reminded of our brokenness. We're reminded of the redemption that Christ did on the cross. And we're reminded of the secure future, secure future we have. In the liturgy, in just a little bit, I'm going to say, in your infinite love, God, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, in other words, in our broken, brokenness, you and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, and to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. Brokenness and redemption, we talk about it every week. And then we also talk about our inheritance. Just before we say the Lord's Prayer, we say, Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Him. Sanctify us also that we faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And listen to this last part. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom, our inheritance. We're reminded about it. Let's live into it. Let's be hope. The hope of Christ. It helps a broken world. It helps you and I to live it out. Let's embody that through the power of the Holy Spirit this week and throughout Advent. Let us pray. Lord, thank you. That on the cross, you took care of our sin problem once and for all. Help us to trust in you, to be believers every day through the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us to embody your hope, because we all know that the story ends well. Help us to live out your gospel in our community here on Hilton Head and beyond this week. And we ask this all. In Jesus' name, amen.